Good morning, church. Whoop, I don't have it on. Is it on? Not yet. Yep. Okay. Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. Who needs the uh, Mormon Tabernacle Choir when you have Delmarie, Natalie, and Adriel? Amen? Amen? Amen. Well, you have me there here this Sabbath to open up the Word of God. And hopefully uh, through him, I as well as you will be inspired by this message. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this gathering here today, Lord. Be with me as I present your word, and may it represent you, Lord. And thank you for this uh, special week that we're having to honor and praise you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We're gathered here today, four days before Christmas, and we're reminded each, every year, of this great event that took place a little over 2,000 years ago, where God entered into our story and came alongside of us to save us and to show us the heart of God. And we come together every year and we think about not only how this event impacted us 2,000 years ago, but we think about where this intersects with our lives today and the relevance it has for our lives today, 2,000 years later. And as we come to the end of 2019, as a community and a country, I think that we need to have this reminder now, perhaps more than ever. You know, I believe that as human beings, you and I, we have something deep within us where we need to make sense out of the events of our lives and the events of our world. But we don't like it when events seem to come into our world and into our life that are random that don't make any sense, that have no apparent meaning. We like to be able to look back at the events of our lives, look back and see how the dots connect, how all things seem to work together for good, and how we can look back over a year or over our lives and see how circumstances kind of connect to bring good into our lives and into our world. And even the bad things, even the bad things, we want to look, be able to look back on them and be able to see how those bad things in our life that appeared random at the time are now kind of making sense. And I think this is unique to being a human being. I don't think animals think about these things. They don't wonder about how events in their lives fit together, but we do. And so when we have that car accident or we lose a job, we hope that enough time passes that we'll be able to look back on that event and see how somehow that seemingly random, meaningless event has led to some kind of good in our lives and into our world. And even the good things that happen to us, we want to be able to make sense of those things. We want to make sense of how we met our spouse, right? Or how our kids came into the world, or how we got our job, our new job. Or how we somehow were able to buy that new home. We want to make sense of these things. Amy, marrying you made a lot of sense. I think of how, <laughs> I don't want to cry. I think of how I met Amy. Some of you that are familiar with us know the story. I was um, in my years. I'm 41, no. <laughs> uh, 81. I was on in my years, and I was single at the time, working at my real estate office, and I'm sitting at my desk, and in walks this beautiful, amazing, intelligent girl, much, much younger than me. <laughs> She was new to the industry. She just got her license. She was an accountant. 
but she just got her license, thought she might try to make a lot of money, okay? And she came into my office. Wow! I like to take her out, I said to myself. Now, this friend of mine in my office, Ann and Gotti, you know, Italian, if you know Italians, knowing this, started kidding me. She said, John, you better leave this girl alone. You're old enough to be her father. You don't have a chance. You don't have a chance. It'll never work. You're too old. She's too young for you. And this amazing girl eventually became my girlfriend and my wife of 23 years. Amen. And now looking back, I could say, wow, being in that office at that time wasn't really random. This was an event that led me to be at that office, at that job, at that time, meeting that woman who would eventually become my wife. And we want to make meaning of these things. Could that have been just a series of random events? Well, certainly it could. But we don't like to look at things like that. We want to look at life and fit all the boxes together and make sure that it all works together, that the dots connect, and that all these events make sense in our lives. You know, we have these things that we say to one another. When tragedies occur, we try to comfort one another. They're not always comforting, but we say them all the same. You know, we say things to each other like, hey, wait, wait, everything happens for a reason. And if we begin to question that, it falls apart really quick, right? You know, my brain tumor is happening for a reason. You know, this tragedy in my life, the loss of my loved one, what reason could that possibly have? Well, it just has to have a reason. Just trust that there's a reason for everything. Or we say things like this. We say, well, there's no such thing as a coincidence. And maybe you guys said this before. I probably said it before. I just don't believe in coincidences. Well, why don't you believe in coincidences? Well, we'll go back to number one. Everything happens for a reason. So there could be no coincidences, right? Or how about this one? Maybe you've had a tragedy or disappointment in your life. And you know, someone looks you in the eye and says, you know, it just wasn't meant to be. Well, why wasn't it meant to be? Because I meant for it to be. I needed for it to be. So I like to talk to the person who doesn't mean it to fit to be because I like to have a conversation with this person. Because I need them to mean it to be because I really need this to happen. And again, we say these things. And when we begin to look at them, we see how quickly these things can break down. But we really want to believe these things. Because there's something in you, and there's something in me, that wants to make sense out of the seemingly random, meaningless, seamless events of our lives. And this is certainly true when the big bumps come in our life, then they come along. When the big bumps come along, like big hurdles that come along in our lives. That's when the questions really start to come, and they come quick, and they come hard. Why? Why is this happening to me? Why is God allowing this to happen to me? I lost two sons years ago. I questioned God. Why? Where is God? Is he involved? Does he care? Does he have any power? Sometimes some of us go through a divorce and we're like, wait a minute, (laughs) wait a minute, time out. This was never a part of my plan. I had the plan I was going to get married, have kids, have a house, a job, happiness, the divorce. That was not part of the plan. So why is this happening? or we go through an extended illness, or we lose a job. And again, we're the person who was never supposed to lose the job. We've never been jobless before. 
And now all of a sudden, you can't find a job. Or we go through a period of infertility, or a spouse is unfaithful to us. And we go through these major bumps in our life, and the questions come again, why? Why this randomness? Why this senselessness? What meaning does this have? This is not part of my plan. Where is God? And this is, only, this is not only true in circumstances in our lives, but it's also true for the circumstances in our world. We've been through some terrible things these past few years. You think about some of the things that have happened in our country that seem so random, so senseless, so meaningless, and so violent. An epic hurricane, Dorian, that left the Bahamas devastated. Islands just flattened. Or a number of mass shootings. Groups going to church or synagogues. And by the time the service is over, people are dead. Or the shooting in Las Vegas, where 58 people were just trying to enjoy themselves at a concert, and they lost their lives. Like, why in the world did this happen? What sense can this possibly make? Just recently, two civilians killed in Pearl Harbor, three young Navy kids at the Pensacola Naval Air Stations. And I'm a Navy veteran, so I felt for that really bad. All these things happen and the questions come. What is the purpose that seems so random? What can the meaning be? Why? We want to make sense of these things, sense in our lives. Why? And all this collides, all this collides with the Christmas story. Because the Christmas story is a story of God. Reaching into seemingly random events, meaningly events, and bringing good out of seemingly random events that took place 2,000 years ago. You know the Christmas story. It's told by a number of people. All four of the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all told the story in their own way. But Luke, Luke is the one who really tells the story. See, he goes into great detail. See, Luke was this guy who's a doctor and became an historian. He's known as one of the best, most accurate historians in history. And he looked and he took to telling the Christmas story his way. You know, like uh, Frank Sinatra, my way. I'd sing for you. That's my favorite song, but I'm not going to sing for you. So I want to look at very briefly just uh, one window of the Christmas story that I think speaks into our experience today. And it's found in Luke chapter 1, and this is from the NIV Bible, Luke chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. So here, we're introduced to some of the major players in the Christmas story. We meet Elizabeth. She's not a major player, but she's a cousin of Mary, and she was an older lady, and she wasn't able to have children. But here she was in her sixth month of pregnancy, showing that strange things were afoot in Israel. And then we meet Gabriel, who was the angel sent by God to appear to Mary. And then we're introduced to Joseph, who would become like a stepfather of of God's son. But then, if there is one major player in the story, other than Jesus, we're introduced to Mary. We're told that Mary lived in Nazareth, 
which was kind of a backwoods town in northern Israel. Now Mary was a young lady at the time because women of this day would be bethroated, would probably be married shortly after puberty. She was probably 13, 14, maybe 15 years old. And Mary was a young woman living in a man's world, which meant that the events of her life had been planned out. Mary would marry at a young age, probably in an arranged marriage. She would give her husband as many children as she could. She probably would lose a few of them before the age of five because of the hard living conditions there. The ones who did survive, she would raise in those very difficult conditions. She would probably live, Mary, in her entire life in Nazareth. She would die there. And a few years after her death, no one would ever think of her or say her name again. That was the plan for Mary's life. But that plan was interrupted. The angel Gabriel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. <laughs> well, Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said, do not be afraid, Mary. And he had to because she was terrified as you and I would be, right? Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. So this is good news. You are highly favored. The Lord is with you. You have found favor with God. I'm bringing you good news, Mary. A new plan for your life. And he begins to outline that plan for her life. He says, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. Are you writing this down, Mary? I'm telling you what's going to happen, Mary. I'm telling you what God's going to do in your life. This is the new plan, Mary. You're going to give birth to the Son of God, and you're going to name him Jesus. That's because he's going to save his people from their sins. He will be great and will be called the Son of God of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. <laughs> That's some great stuff happening here. And she's going to have a child. He's going to be the son of God, the son of the Most High. That he's going to be on the throne of his father David. He's going to reign. His kingdom will never end. This is great news. And Mary, is taking it all in. And then she asks a really good question. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin. And again, this is a good question that Mary is asking. Because it shows Mary understood how things worked, it also shows that she was paying attention to the angel. Wait a minute, time out. I'm going to have a child. Let's go back to that part because... I I've never been with a man. How will this happen? And the angel explained it to her. The Holy Spirit will come on you. And the power of the Most High, the Son of God, will be with you. And indeed, He is. He's been associated with the Son of God, called the Son of God. And as you came in here today in church, you heard the name of Jesus before you came here. Most likely you've associated that name with the Son of God. Whether you believe that or not, that is the association. And so the angel's prophecy, the plan, has certainly been realized. And Gabriel continues. And he says, even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. In other words, here is evidence again that God is up to something. And then he finishes by saying, for no word from God will ever, ever fail. Amen? And so he kind of ends with this assurance that this is going to happen. No word from God will ever, ever fail. In other words, no plan of God will ever fail. God's will, His will, will be done. Amen. Well, then the angel leaves, and Mary is left to figure out and negotiate this new plan on her own. 
Because now she doesn't have the angel Gabriel with her explaining what he explained to her, what she has explained to her parents and to the community and to Joseph. And this greatly complicates Mary's life. Mary now has a very complicated relationship with her parents because she is now an unwed teenage pregnant girl. And she has to explain things to her parents. Her parents didn't see the angel. They never heard of such a thing. So that relationship is going to be complicated. Her relationship with her community is complicated because a girl of her age who is pregnant out of wedlock could be executed and be stoned in those days. So obviously, that relationship is also complicated. Her relationship with Joseph is really complicated. Joseph, I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything. And he's wondering about this girl. I thought she was a girl of virtue. (laughs) But she said that she is pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Well, fortunately, folks, Joseph is given a vision in a dream, and he ends up coming on board with the whole thing. Amen? So Mary Mary is able to fit all these into boxes because she understood all of this was a part of God's plan for her. All of this made sense. None of it was random. But that's when things start getting really random for Mary. You see, a census is decreed. And she and Joseph are told that they have to leave Nazareth, their hometown, where all her support system was. They would have to go to Bethlehem over a hundred miles. And she would have to travel there late in her pregnancy on a donkey. Well, folks, talk about complicating her life. Talk about randomness. Why do I have to go to Bethlehem to have this child? And of course, you and I know what happens once she got to Bethlehem. There was no room for them. The city was so overcrowded that there was no room for her to give birth. So I get a little sense of what Mary must have been feeling. Let's say, for example, you go to Costco just before Christmas. (laughs) Somebody's laughing. (laughs) And there's no room in the parking lot, and you say things, you know. Every spot is full. It's overcrowded. People are going crazy buying gifts. Everyone is shopping at the last minute. And you have to circle around and around and around and around like five minutes until somebody finally pulls out and you get your spot. So this must have been how Mary felt. Just think what it would be like to be a pregnant woman going to a town 100 miles from your home, not knowing a soul, having the contractions begin, knowing that you're about to give birth, and you have nowhere clean, nowhere warm, nowhere safe, And no one to help you give birth to this child. And you end up in a cave that's cold and dark, damp and smelly. You're surrounded with animals. You're on dirty hay. You have no one around to deliver this child except Joseph. This guy that you're just getting to know. There's no midwife there to help her. No family to support her. And she must have been thinking, why this? How random is this? This this is so meaningless to give birth to this child in this environment. I thought I was highly favored. I thought God was with me. Isn't this his son? Does he really want this child in this environment? And things just continue to deteriorate from there. Things get really tragic. Because not long after, when Herod hears that a king has been born that can threaten his throne, he wants to wipe out any threat of his throne. And he sends words out to his soldiers to go to Bethlehem, kill every child, two and under. Every child, two and under. Every boy in Bethlehem, kill them. And God warns Mary and Joseph before the soldiers come, 
but the soldiers come. And in one day, countless mothers and fathers have their two and one and infant children ripped from their arms and senselessly slaughtered. How random. How meaningless. What a random act of violence. And Mary had to live with the knowledge that God warned her. And she escaped with her child. But he didn't warn anyone else. But the randomness didn't stop there. (laughs) Mary would watch her son grow up. And she would watch him become a great man who did great things for the world. But then she would watch as he was accused of a crime he did not commit. And everyone knew he didn't commit it. And she would watch as her son would be whipped and beaten for that crime that he was committed of doing. She would watch as he was flogged, having the flesh ripped out from his back. She would watch him carry a cross to the streets of Jerusalem as people who once cheered him were now cheering against him. And they were throwing things at him and jeering at him and spitting at his face. She would watch as he would just labor up the side of a hill. And now as he would lay on a cross and be nailed to the cross hand and foot, be lifted and dropped into a hole. She would watch her son hang there between heaven and earth and die. (laughs) Miss Harley, favorite of God, Miss, the Lord is with you, watching this happen to her son needlessly and apparently randomly. And I wonder if she ever wanted to call the angel Gabriel back down and say, hmm, could we have a conversation? Because none of this was the plan that you gave me. You said I was highly favored. You said God was with me. You said that I was blessed. But this has been anything but a blessed journey. It appears that all of this is random. It appears that God is nowhere to be found. It appears that God doesn't care. It appears that God has lost control of the situation. But of course, those of us in church looking back with the benefit of history are able to look back and see that God was anything, anything but out of control. He was completely in control, amen? And that while he might have caused, not have caused everything, he was working in everything to bring about the greatest good for our world that has ever occurred. That God in the midst of these random experiences, in these random experiences was right in the crosshair of God's greatest activity on our planet at that time to bring about redemption. To bring about redemption for the broken and forgiveness of sins. And three days later when Jesus rose from the grave as he predicted he would, he forever conquered sin and evil and death. And by doing that, by raising from the grave three days later, later, he showed God's ability to bring life out of death, to bring beauty out of ashes, and to bring meaning and purpose and out of the apparent random events of our world and of our lives. See, Jesus demonstrates through his birth, his life, his death, his resurrection, that God is actively at work in our world and in our lives to redeem every broken thing, to straighten every crooked road, to give life and death, and to give purpose where there seems to be no purpose. I mean, this story, the Christmas story, tells us that good, that good will ultimately win. Amen? And that love will actually ultimately end up on top. Now to go back to that original story, that conversation between Mary and Gabriel, at the end of that conversation, Mary ends up saying something that I find so deeply profound. The teenage girl, this teenage girl, who has this new plan on life sprung on her, 
not knowing everything that is going to happen to her, not knowing the good and the bad, the painful and the triumphant, not knowing all the randomness of her life, is able to say something that I feel is so profound. And I think it relates to us again today. She able, she's able to say, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. May your word to, be, to me be fulfilled. I think what she's trying to say there is that, while I don't understand what's going to happen to me, and I'm not going to always be able to make sense of my life, and while I may not always be able to see what God is doing behind the scenes, behind apparently random events of my life, even in the middle of that, may God's will be done ultimately. Amen? Because I will trust Him. You see, this is incredible faith that Mary is showing. You know, we often think about faith as just why I believe that God exists. But Mary here is exhibiting so much more than that. Mary's faith is what moved her to trust God when it didn't seem like he was moving. And she moved through those random events in her life. Those painful events were like the big bumps, the big hurdles of her life. And while she wasn't able to see what God was doing, while she couldn't explain it, while she couldn't fit it into the boxes, she was able to say, God, I'm going to trust that you are at work and that ultimately you will come up on top. Amen? And that is your plan for me and that your plan will be fulfilled. And so, what are you trying to make sense of in your lives this Christmas? Apparent randomness in our world. Are you really, some of us, wrestling with this? Trying to say, what is the meaning of this? Why did this happen? Why is this happening? Why is this happening to me? This Christmas, let's be reminded that even behind the randomness, God is reaching in. While He may not be causing it, he can work it in to bring good things out of bad. Amen? And this baby boy, born 2,000 years ago, who grew up and lived and died and rose again, that he is able to reach into our story and work good out of bad and redeem what is broken in us and that ultimately good will triumph over evil, and that love will win. And as we contemplate the randomness of our life and of our world this Christmas, may we enter into this Christmas holiday and celebration entering 2020 with the faith of Mary. To be able to say, you know what, God? I don't see what you're doing or why you're doing it. I can't connect the dots right now. It's not making any sense to me. But maybe to me, it's according to your word. Because I trust God that you're at work. Amen. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, on this Sabbath day, just a few days before Christmas, Lord, as we're gathered in this sacred place. Sure, it's much easier to believe that you're at work while we're here and that you are working good out of bad. And as we soon approach the new year, dear Lord, and come into our own unknown experiences and events that might come into our lives, that sometimes we just can't make sense of them. We just pray that we can carry the story of Christmas with us into this new year. Events and experience that at times we just can't understand why these things are happening. We can see you behind them, Lord. We can see you behind them. A good God. A powerful God. 
a loving God, a God who knows all, who's weaving things together to ultimately work good in our lives and into our world. Now, God, on the Sabbath day, be with us here in this place in your precious name.